My name is Mark Rosegrant. I'm the Director of the Environment and Production Technology Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI for short. Uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C., but IFPRI also has uh, offices around the world. We have about two-thirds of our staff at the Washington headquarters and one-third uh, in, in many offices around the world, and, and including uh, India, China, and, and a number of other Asian countries. Mm. You know, my, my own research has tended to be on, on water resources, uh, food policy uh, in, in the broad sense, and I, I've done a lot of modeling in, uh, of, of the global food situation uh, for many years and looking at long-term scenarios of food security. I think we need to worry about it now, partly because many of the solutions that we can talk about later are long-term solutions, that they, re they require starting of investments and policy reform now to influence the future as well. And we do see uh, uh, food insecurities and, and the potential for continued rise in, in real food prices over time, which, which of course harm mostly the poor because, uh, because food is such a large part of the, uh, their consumption uh, that high prices if double hit make food more expensive and also hurt their real income as well. Let me highlight a few things, because we, uh, we see the problems are both on the demand side, as you said, the population growth, uh, rapid, rapid income growth in parts of the world. Even Africa, we're going to see high in, uh, income growth in the future and high uh, growth in demand for food, so that's putting pressure on the international markets uh, as well. Hmm. On the supply side, you already mentioned key things, is climate change, uh, growing scarcity of water, which actually is happening even without climate change as, as, as demand for water grows and supply grows very little because of the high cost of, of dams, for example. Uh, and land degradation and land scarcity is also a, a big future uh, problem. So th the solutions lie in a number of areas. Uh, first, in the need to increase in investment in agriculture research, because uh, the key is really going to be increased productivity growth in agriculture uh, in, in order to grow enough food to, to meet the demand. So agriculture research is, is the, the first big step. Secondly, there, we have to move more towards resource conserving technologies at the farm level. So these are technologies that not only help increase crop yields and, and livestock yields, but also help conserve resources such as water and, and if, if implemented properly, can reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well. These include things like precision agriculture, uh, integrated soil fertility management, and nitrogen use of efficiency, uh, among, and, and low tillage, conservation tillage, that also helps preserve soil and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To get those kinds of things, we also need to in, improve extension systems. Uh, the big public extension systems are mostly not uh, effective anymore, have been cut dramatically, so we need to have, have continued input from those public extension, but also much more private extension and NGOs and, and using IT media to get the message out to, to farmers as well. A third big area is rural infrastructure investment. So one area is going to be uh, cost-effective investment in irrigation, but also in many countries in Africa, South Asia as well, uh, the rural road networks are not adequate to get to get inputs to farmers at a reasonable price and get their outputs in, into the market. So you need, there has to be a significant increase in investment in, in rural infrastructure as well. Fourth area is, is broader economic policy. So right now uh, we're facing, you know, many countries have relied on direct subsidies to farmers on fertilizer, energy, water. That encourages overuse of those uh, of those inputs and and you know, pollution from, from too much nitrogen use or, or ineffective water use, and also tend to increase greenhouse gas emissions. So gradual phasing out of those subsidies, replacing them, for example, perhaps with direct income support that does not uh, directly affect uh, pr production decisions. So uh, we also need to move towards continued open trade. You know, there's been some threat uh, to open trade because of the high prices in 2008, 2000 level, many countries sort of pulled back, they blocked their exports or, or put taxes on the imports. Those kinds of things made many countries lose confidence in the world trading system. We have to restore that 
that confidence uh, because it's only through the having open trade that we can uh, maintain a sufficient supply to developing countries, particularly in times of, of, of production shocks as well. So those, those are some of the key areas that, that we need to focus on to ensure longer term food security. I think one well, of the keys, of course, Asia is just such a big player now. If you take China, uh, India, and, and if you aggregate the, the Southeast Asian countries like, like uh, Singapore, Philippines, Thailand, and in, in Indonesia, they're very big in terms of uh, demand. You know, they're, they're starting to reduce per capita demand in some of the staples like particularly rice, but then rapid gro growth in higher value commodities uh, such as fruits and vegetables, meats, and others. So they're really going to be one of the big driving forces in what happens in, in, in global agriculture from the demand side. Then they also have, of course, the potential to play a key role on the, the supply side in, in terms of, uh, of course, being big exporters of rice, uh, uh, but also being able to grow, if they invest in research, uh, can also grow more of the other foods, uh, like maize and wheat in certain areas. Uh, the, so I think in, in a Asia, a lot of the thing is going to be uh, integrating the private and the public sector, uh, particularly in value chains, uh, in terms of specific specifics. You know, as you know, we've already seen this big expansion of supermarkets, mm. demand for high valued foods, uh, high quality foods, and safe food. And so I think there has to be a lot done in order to improve the value chains and, and improve the management of food safety and food quality. And I think that's going to be one of the key things going forward uh, mm -hmm. in Asia. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, there was a small burst of investment in, in 2009 to 2010 because because uh, private companies, even more governments, uh, saw the prices going up. So they saw that. So the private companies saw this as an in, income generator, and, and the public sector wanted to keep those prices down for political reasons. So there's a bit of investment, but those kinds of investments in the supply side seem to always follow a, a cycle. So rather than having, say, stable long-term investments. It, it goes up when food prices go up and then falls back down and now we're seeing it back on the downswing. So we have to get away from this sort of boom and bust cycle of investment in, on the supply side and get into more stable long-term financing. But you know, if you look now, you know, the, the private crop science uh, uh, companies, Syngenta and Monsanto and others, have, have had to pull way back because their profits are way down because of those prices. So, so it, it's a tough situation for them, but we really need them back in the game as well as uh, is, long-term public sector investment. That's tough. I mean, you know, I think there, governments have to realize that, that this is a long-term game, but as you, it, the, the you know, politicians tend to look at the very short term. You know, uh, you know, in many countries you talk about, you know, including the United States, unfortunately, uh, Looking out to 2050, uh, governments aren't interested in, in, or at least many of the public uh, politicians aren't interested in, in solutions that out 50 years from now. They're interested in how do they win their next election, so they tend to focus on short-term issues. And the private sector tends to focus on short-term profits rather than, say, long-term uh, profits and, 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 you know, and long-term value of their stocks. They, they're in it for the short run. So it's very difficult to do. I think certainly, obviously, there's very little you can do to force the private sector to, uh, to invest if it's not profitable. So you know, maintaining profitability is very important. Governments really should try to, to stay in these kinds of investments for the longer term and start focusing on climate change investments as well. So again, I think Many countries, let's start with the free trade issue. I mean, many countries, as I mentioned, that have, you know, it's all, well, let's face it, it's always been uh, an issue that many countries want to be self sufficient, at least in their, in some of their major staples like rice in, in Asia. You find, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, and many other countries want to be able to be self sufficient. But unfortunately, that they oftentimes pursue those policies, those self sufficiency goals with bad policies such as trade restrictions. Uh, uh, subsidies uh, as well, so that ends up costing a lot of money to the economies. If they, 
if they would relax this uh, reliance on, on the, the self-sufficiency goal and increase the long-term research investment, long-term profitability of the sector, they would actually come closer to achieving those goals than they do by all these distortions which drive down the productivity and the efficiency of, the, of those sectors.